Um, I'm actually speaking about an ALTC funded project or Office of Learning and Teaching funded project that is looking across 13 case studies. This is the first time we've ever actually presented this data, so I'm actually really interested to get your thoughts. So I'm going to ask you to spend the next 18 minutes thinking with me. I hope everyone had their coffee. Um, and I'm speaking actually on behalf of a whole bunch of people here. There's a tiny picture here and a bigger picture on our website. For the sake of time, I'm not going to tell you how amazing they all are, but they're pretty amazing. So this is a, a big group project. The technology. There we go. So quantitative skills. Some of you might remember Professor Gavin Brown, who wrote a report a few years ago about quantitative disciplines, specifically in Australia, looking at higher education. Basically, he raised some alarm bells that I feel pretty much resonated with those of us who teach in higher education and are familiar with <coughs> students and how they approach quantitative disciplines. But when we think about quantitative skills, what do we mean by that? So in our project, we spent a lot of time trying to define quantitative skills. And what we came up with is the application of mathematical and statistical thinking and reasoning in a given context. And we're talking about it in science. So it's students' abilities to apply math and stats. Would you agree that that is important for a science graduate? So it's a big word, so get this. But our project, we had a few educated assumptions, assumptions based off of the literature. And on our website, you can actually see all the literature. For the sake of time, though, and because we generally agree this is important, I'm not going to try to convince you of this. But I want you to understand our thinking. Um, if I can move in the right direction. <laughs> we thought backwards a lot. <laughs> so science is a quantitative discipline. This is our belief, our assumption. The literature supports that. And we in this room would, would support that. Quantitative skills are an essential learning outcome in science, therefore. We agree it's important in science, you need it to be a scientist. We would say a university education should give you this, our students quantitative skills. And then when we thought about it, massive statistics applied in science. So that it's inherently interdisciplinary. It's something that's inherently interdisciplinary, quite complicated. Our next assumption is that holistic curricular design is actually required if we're going to build quantitative skills in science. Do those assumptions, this kind of educated hypothesis, it, does it make sense to you? So you can understand our thinking. So then the question is, how are science curricula designed to develop, to build, to instill in our graduates' quantitative skills? This is one of the questions that we are investigating and exploring within the Australian context. We took a case study approach, and I'm not, I love methodology, and I love research, and I'd love to tell you how we came up with all the choices we did and exactly how we gathered all the data, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that, and because that information has been published on our website. So you can read it or we can talk to it afterwards, but I really want to get into what we found and, and then think about that together. But we did take a case study approach, and we looked at science, 13 science curricula and our one learning outcome, quantitative skills. And what we did to think about how can we represent something so complicated, a whole science curriculum, right? We're looking at it holistically. Over the course of the three or four years a student is in a science program, how are they learning this? Where are they learning it? How are we designing or intending them to gain skills? So we came up with a, a visual curricular mapping tool, which is actually also available on our website, so you can use this if you'd like to. But the main idea of it Quite simple, because I'm a fan of sometimes simple is better than overly complicating ourselves. Sort of like colored by numbers. You can see here, a typical student in one year is going to take uh, over two semesters, eight units, right? And then two years later, they go through another year, a whole bunch of units. Third year, a bunch of units, right? That's how we get students to enroll. So if we just took that simple pattern, and then we said, where are we teaching quantitative skills? Where are we teaching massive stats? Where are students being asked to apply them? And then who is teaching that? Our biologists teaching it? Our chemists teaching it? Our mathematicians teaching it? Statisticians? So it's a lot of complex information. We try to find a simple way to represent it. And we went to 13 universities and asked them, tell us how, what you're doing quantitative skills. Well, you can imagine people all over the shop, they're doing these many amazing things. A lot of great boutique 
courses, you know, fantastic third year courses people would tell me about and say, oh great, how many of your science students take it? Oh, five, maybe seven, sometimes 10. So we had to be specific here for the, the sake of comparison. So we asked people to say, tell us where quantitative skills are substantially taught and, accept, and assessed, where something's compulsory or highly recommended, or you know the majority of the students within your science degree, within that major, will take that course. We call that sort of the critical pathway. We wanted to see the critical pathway. Science degrees are inherently flexible, so it makes mapping really challenging. And here's what we found. Now, not that you're gonna see this. These are our 13 visual diagrams, though. And I just want to take a moment there. You can see they're kind of numbered. Each one represents one university. And remember, gray is where math department's teaching or stats department's teaching it. Purple is where the discipline is teaching it. Most of these are life sciences majors. There's one chemistry major. And a whole block filled in, a square means it's a whole dedicated unit, a whole course. And a little dot means it's embedded within a course. So it's a QS module within a, a, a kind of another type of course, not a course dedicated to QS. So we see 13 case studies there. You see our two benchmarking from the United States. I made them a bit smaller because for the purposes of this, just wanted to take a moment to give you that overview. This is what we found. Can you recognize your university by chance? <laughs> Do you think your university you could sit down with a group of people who teach within your major, you're a chemist, you're a biologist, and you could actually identify where your students are learning and being assessed on quantitative skills? This is really challenging for us to do. It looks simple in the way we finally represented it, but it was really challenging to get this information. Do you see any patterns? Yeah, you want to share? Well, standard uh, year one mathematics uh, followed by embedded bits and pieces in the bunkers, basically. Would people agree they see that general pattern? So we see mathematicians and statisticians teaching maths and stats knowledge, and then someone's applying it. See that pattern there? Would it help? So half of these institutions are actually a group of eight, and half aren't. Do you think you could pick out the group of eight universities by looking at this? Our team had a bit of assumption that we might see a pattern there based on that, but you can look at that, and it's hard to see any pattern whatsoever. It's a bit like asking, do you recognize your DNA there? <laughs> <laughs> There's a blueprint. So it, it's interesting as we looked at this, and one of the things you can say, it's so obvious, that there's a lot of white space. In the second year as well, interesting. Quiet in the second year in many places. Say that again, Les Kirk. It's quiet in the second year as well, skills in many places. It's quiet? We're quiet. There's nothing in there, nothing in the boxes. So you can sort of that second year slope, perhaps, or the challenge of actually trying to identify where quantitative skills are taught in second year. So if we think and we've already said this, and you all agree, and we assumed it, and people have told us all over the many countries, quantitative skills are an essential learning outcome for students. And then when you look at this, would you say quantitative skills are an essential learning outcome for our science students? How many of you have mothers? <laughs> We're so like, I have a mom. I still have a mom. Sometimes she likes to tell me what to do. I'm um, still. And she likes to give me useful advice. Did she ever tell you, my mommy said something like this. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> and sometimes when I look at this, I see that, because it's like we're saying it and we're telling you, but we're not actually doing it. When you look at this perspective, when you take the bigger picture, step back and say, how do students experience learning? I teach my course, and I know I do it really, really well, but guess what? They walk out of my door, and they go into someone else's, and then they actually go into life, too. So from the perspective of students, it's much more complicated sometimes in the way we see the little bit of interaction we have with them. So thinking about this holistically. Any other patterns? I know this is a lot to take in. And we spent, our team spent a lot of time thinking about this and saying, what are we seeing here? That one American university seems to have a lot more than 
So in, that, in the American universe, yeah, you can see a bit more. One of them, actually, you might not, but in the other, no, the others. And there's a reason we picked those two benchmarking universities I'll tell you about in a moment. Do people actually identify the components that they're, they're actually delivering? Like our third year quantum, we've got embedded math and in the lab, they've got the quantitative skills in, in the lab. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you ask me that question, I'm not sure that I would have flagged that as a course yep. where we've got the quantitative skills. So this is an important, yeah, an important point you're raising. And when we start to scratch the surface of this, you should actually have sort of many questions. Um, which we won't be able to get through all of today. But one of the aspects and the challenge of this is, in our pattern of, of getting this information, we talk to associate dean academics who we have an assumption that for most of them, their role, they have a kind of, they're meant to have a bigger picture view of curriculum. And then we talk to people teaching on the ground. So we had that combination. And then we went online and said, what do you actually show students? And we gathered that data. Then we created this and then we sent it back to those people and said, is this right? Do we need to talk to more people? And for some of those universities, we had quite a back and forth to make sure this really represented. But that was one of the challenges. So people had trouble actually identifying where they were taught as well because science curriculum is so complicated. That's why we tried to focus as well on the critical pathway. In general, if you teach within a major, you coordinate a major, you should have some notion where the majority of your students are. Some courses will be compulsory. Some will be recommended. The increasing prevalence of capstone units mean you actually know where your students are in third year. So are there quantitative skills there? So that's one of the ways we tried to focus it down. Now we did find, I want to find, um, we did find a way of looking, when we looked at it at year level, because we were looking at all three years saying, let's find a pattern, and we couldn't. So then we looked at it at year level, and said, okay, let's think about this first year, second year, third year, and let's think about what we see. So this is the process we went through, and this is something we came up with. So we see here, this is one visual diagram. And let's look at second level for a moment. We see a lot of white space in one, purple unit. That means the discipline, this is a life sciences major, so the biologists were actually teaching a lot of stats course here. A whole course dedicated to statistics within the context of biology. So we looked at that and said, okay, second year they're taking a, a unit approach, a unit model. Their model of curriculum for teaching quantitative skills in second year is a unit, a unit model. Now, we looked at third year and we said there, there's a module within their capstone unit where they know students are. It's an, an embed approach, an embed model to building quantitative skills. So we can say their third year approach is they have an embedded model thinking about their curriculum to build this learning outcome. And this, I'm sure you can imagine, we're very clever. It's the hybrid model. So what we see in first year is there's a unit and there's an embedded approach. So their philosophy there, they might not know it, but this is what they're doing. They have a hybrid model to thinking about the curriculum. Now one of the things as well, let's look at another one, because there's actually four models, and you might be able to work, work out what the next one's gonna be. That's <laughs> where it's not. Now let me be clear, this doesn't mean that quantitative skills weren't being taught. It means they couldn't identify where they were being taught. They weren't visible to the academics who teach into that unit who we talked to. They couldn't identify them. So when we think about this, I'm going to go back now. I think when we thought about this, what's the contribution that we can make here? People have been talking to us about standards. Anybody heard about standards in the last? <laughs> A TLO? A teaching and learning overload? Um, trying to think about this more holistically, because that's what the TLOs are really trying to get us to do, in my opinion. They're trying to say, let's think about student learning and how we design curriculum holistically. This, to me, and our project team club, this is a way to help us think about it. Now, we've mapped what people do, and a lot of people are taking their TLOs and they're saying, this is what we do. Let's think about how we design, and we need a language for that. So when you go within a university and say, okay, we need to build quantitative skills, What's our philosophy? Do we have a unit approach? Do we need a hybrid approach? Are we just embedding it within disciplinary context? Let me, and we, we had this debate too, inevitably soon asked. These are 11 Australian universities and 11 different approaches in Australia. What's the best approach? What's an effective approach? What's a good approach? 
which one of these approaches is actually helping us to build quantitative skills for our graduates? Is it the unit model? Is it the hybrid model? And what about silence? I think we would all probably agree that if we can't see it, the students can't see it, that's definitely not going to help us. But which? So here we've got a something that's already mapped looking across universities and we know what people generally, what they can identify. Now when we also did this, we also asked people, how do you know it's working? Can you imagine, think of your own university. I mean, this is the challenge. How do we know it's working? Well, you'll be able to sit we no one had any actually evaluation of it at the level of the graduate sort of learning. No one would confidently say, we feel like this is it and we can, we can show you, we can demonstrate that. That's the next step, it's the next challenge where I think a lot of us are when it comes to these types of, of learning outcomes approaches to do that. There's some good news though, I'll, I'll tell you guys a little more, there's a lot of good news. So we now, let's look at this uh, a little bit quantitatively. So we've got our four models, right? Four ways people have, are doing curriculum. Perhaps in the future, people will start designing more around this because they'll specifically say, we want to have a hybrid model at all three year levels, or we want to have a combination of these. But what did we find? So first year, 62% of those universities we looked at had the hybrid model. So it was a unit and then some embedded modules that they could identify. I cannot tell you that those were coordinated embedded modules, and most of the people couldn't tell me that either, but they could look at the units and say, yep, yeah, there's modules and there's you know, a master statistics unit. At second year, we see the hybrid model is gone, and people are either doing an embed model, or they have an, a unit approach model. And unfortunately, then we see the silent model starting to creep up on us, where people aren't able to actually identify where that learning outcome, this essential learning outcome is. And at third year, we see the dominance of the embed model. Now, if you spend more time thinking about this, you probably make sense of this in many different ways, but this is just what we found. And it's a, a heuristic device, a way to try to get us to think about holistic curriculum and different models we might have. Now, I have got two minutes and 15 seconds left before I keep you from your morning tea. Let's stick to my 19 minutes. So I actually want to leave it at that. And I want to ask you all, you might have some questions for me, our team, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, do you see a value in thinking about curriculum models? Do you see a way that we could use something like this within our own universities when we talk about teaching and learning? Yes. <laughs> because the literature and our experience told us it's largely the life sciences that have taken out the mass and the stats. And there's a bigger push within the literature to say the life sciences have got to reintegrate those quantitative skills. And so when you talk to people in chemistry, no one in chemistry will debate. You can't do chemistry unless you, you can think mathematically. Uh, where in the life sciences, it might not always be as evident. So there is a reason as we chose that. Yes? When you try to simplify something like this, it eases hugely the digestibility of the pattern that might emerge. But you also lose, as you obviously are aware, with an incredible amount of information. Yep. And if you were to do the same mapping by asking where is new skill introduced and where skills are expected, practiced, and assessed as part of um, um, problem solving, yeah. then you would find an entirely different picture, I'm sure. Yes, and I suspect if you, I mean, this model might work for actually any learning outcome. It doesn't need to necessarily be QS. I think here was a, where we were starting as a community is we knew this was important, everyone was struggling. However, thinking about it holistically in a digestible way, 
my thinking is a tool like this could actually be useful because it's actually quite simple. Um, the dog's barking. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for McHealy for his dog. Um, but to me, the value I could see of using a tool like this within my own institution is to say, this is a simple way of looking at it, but let's scratch the surface. So first year coordinators might come together and the chemistry of the biologist might say, yes, in our prac, we've got a QS component. We have them do graphical interpretation of data. And I'd say, great, can we see that? And then how do you assess it? So it's a tool within the university to get people to first just take that bigger picture view and then to start actually sharing so people can see where, where they are and what's happening. Sorry, I've got, I know it's, it's tea time, so I'll come here and then I'll come back there. Yeah. Tell me. Um, for those dots, would, would you get a dot if somebody has just embedded it in one practical exercise? What we asked them with the dots, and this is us being diplomatic, was it's taught and it's assessed. And we went back and forth with some people about what that meant, and some people weren't so happy with things perhaps not being included. But largely it was a collegial kind of process. Again, if you scratch the surface of this, which people hopefully will do within their own universities, and I know I've got some people talking about this, it does come back to how much is it actually assessed. How much are we actually really embedding it? And are we explicitly telling the students, which relates to Mary's talk yesterday with that kind of QS, how much are we actually stating these objectives? Sorry, this question. Yes. Yes, many science programs have a uniform approach. They have set number of subjects that the students have to take in first and second year, but the third year is primarily or almost entirely an empty. So yeah. how would you select the units of study for this is the challenge of the science degree, isn't it? Let me just point something out. One of these is actually a structured name degree. It's a Bachelor of Biomedical Science, which a lot of universities run in specific name degrees. And the difference is they are, they might take the same exact units as a, a science, a Bachelor of Science student, but it's structured. That was number seven. Even when it's structured, you know where students are. That issue emerged. But to get back to your question, quite uh, just simply, quickly, that's why I think we see the emergence of, of capstone units and debates institutions have to have about what's right for their Bachelor of Science. If we want to achieve our teaching and learning outcomes, if we want to have certain standards reached, is that argument how much flexibility do we have versus how much structure do we have? So, this study, did you just have representative units for the year, or how did you say? No, the units were based on when we went to the universities and captured the data with the associate dean academics and the academics teaching into it. They identified the critical pathway where the majority of their students were rolling and taking those courses. So it was based on their notion of where their students are enrolling, which is why we had to focus in on a major as well. So there's a question. Okay, I'll go here. Oh, no, you had your hand up first. Sorry, I've been neglecting you. Go ahead. Um, you asked the question at the beginning um, whether we thought this was a useful way. It's, it's probably pretty sure to need some data on outcomes to see if there's any, any correlation. Uh -huh. And so you just made me go on to my next great thing here. This is the challenge in Australia. We are, at, well, it's actually a challenge in many countries. How do we evidence these things? And as scientists, how do we gather data to inform which models might be great? There's a great opportunity here, actually, for a follow-up project that says the QS project actually found this. The next project is going to be we're going to go and try to do assessment to find out what models might be good so that we can be informed to say, you know what, actually the hybrid model seems to be the most sensible people are talking, or the unit model is actually quite good, or it needs to be different at every year level. We, we don't have that information. You might have noticed in your pack though, you've got a set of flyers. And the last flyer statement together for this is actually a talk in December here in Sydney from one of the universities in America that we deliberately fixed because they have evaluation evidence learning outcomes and student perceptions of how students do quantitative skills. So they're going to come and talk to us about that to understand a model or an approach for doing that within a biology major. Um, but it's, I think it's a very interesting model and how they actually get academics to pay attention to that data. To me that's the most important thing. Because you can collect all the data you want but if the people teaching don't pay any attention to it. So how they actually use that in their teaching and learning meetings to inform the curriculum design. So that would be, I think, a fascinating kind of talk to have. Really eye-opening. I'm, so, I'm just aware we're in tea time, so I guess if you want to go to tea, you can go. If you want to talk some more, we can talk some more. First, thank Kelly very much. For you.
good approach and, and good stuff. Thank you.